Thank you very much. Thank you. What an introduction. Things can only go badly now, can't they? <laughs> I'd rather you said, we found this guy, he's not very good. That would have been better. Um, <laughs> now then, I just need to... Uh, will it be that one? No. That one. There we go. Great. Um, <clears throat> it's fantastic to be with you this morning. By the way, I think I look like Madonna. <laughs> I know you're thinking, no, you don't. <laughs> um, I'd like to begin with a confession. That doesn't work, if I can. Um, I hate technology. It's a new thing. I used to like technology. I used to love technology. I used to be passionate about technology. But now I hate technology. Does anyone recognize where that's from? Have any of you got Nintendo Wii at home? A Wii machine? Yeah. We bought a Nintendo Wii machine recently at home for the family. And I understood it was a games machine, which makes you feel better about your life, playing computer games. So we went and bought one particular game. Some of you may recognize it, called Wii Fit. Any of you got Wii Fit at home? If you haven't, don't buy it. <laughs> so we get home with our Wii Fit. I have two young children. I'm going to tell you a little bit about them later. We get our Wii Fit home. I'm thinking, I am now at the forefront of technology. This is going to make my life better. So I unpack my Wii Fit. And the, one of the things you have to do, because it's a whole fitness regime, and, and as you can see, it hasn't worked. Um, so we um, And the thing is, the first thing you have to do is you get on the machine so that it can weigh you and decide how fit you are. It's a game that's meant to make you feel better. I have a character in my Nintendo Wii that I created, okay, that's thin and muscular and like this. <laughs> so I stand on the machine. I paid 3,000 kroner for this machine. So I stand on the machine. And the first thing it tells me is, I am obese. A computer game tells me I'm fat. And then it brings on my character. And in front of me, on the television screen, it makes my character go, <laughs> So don't talk to me about technology. <laughs> What I'd like to do in the time I've got with you this morning is I'd like to uh, set a question, pose some questions, I think. Because in all seriousness, however we feel, whatever generation we come from, technology has had an enormous impact on our lives today. And it's going to have an impact on our lives tomorrow that we can't even uh, calculate, can we? We have no idea of the impact. If you think, for example, <clears throat> that if somebody mentioned the internet 30 years ago, inside a lifetime, who would have known? Who would have known the impact it's had on our lives? Mobile phone technology 30 years ago, who would have known the way it had transformed the way we think and live and expect the world to function around us? So what I want to do is talk a little bit today about some of the challenges I think that face education, some of the things we need to do when we reconfigure what it is we have to do in education to ensure that our children don't just survive but thrive in their future. And the question I want to put before you all as you go through your conference today is how can technology help to support and make a difference to those challenges? You see, I do have a real concern. And the real concern is that the UK, I think, for quite a substantial number of years now, has been seen as a country that has been at the forefront of technology and education. I don't believe that's true, and I'll explain why. I hope there's no one from the British government here, by the way. Um, like all countries, our education systems have been overloaded with pressure and uh, government strategy and curriculum and testing, right? So we've lived in a world as educators, haven't we, where we've been running just to keep up. We don't have time to breathe and think most of the time because we're spending most of our time delivering learning to the children. 
And of course, whilst we've been running just to keep up, the world's been changing enormously around us. So in Britain, what's happened over the last 20 or 30 years is there has been an enormous investment in technology infrastructure in our schools. But I would argue it's the wrong kind of investment made by the wrong kind of people. And they weren't asking the right questions. And that's what I want to share with you today. You see, in Britain what happened was there was an obsession from a generation of politicians and civil servants who frankly were too old to understand the true impact of technology who were saying what we need is computers in our schools. Because the thing that Britain has, is so proud of is how many computers they have in their schools. So I think now the ratio is about one computer for every six or seven students. It's quite impressive. So <clears throat> what they did was they sent people who had no real technology background around the world to the big uh, technology conferences like the one in Vegas to go and see what was new in technology. And a few years ago, they stumbled across these. And I'm sure all of you recognize them. There it is, the interactive whiteboard. Apparently the greatest technological innovation since man discovered the wheel. Right. And this apparently, this single device was going to transform education in the United Kingdom and bring it into a place that was beyond education for the 21st century. This. Now correct me if I'm wrong. But that looks like the same kind of boards children in Victorian in the 18th century had in their schools, just without chalk. The interesting thing was, what happened was in Britain, the government insisted that every school spent its entire technology budget on making sure that every classroom had those. Now, actually it had quite an interesting impact. For the first year or two, Everyone thought they were quite groovy. Everyone thought they were quite cool. The kids thought it was really cool that you could suddenly play on this board. Teachers were blown away. You can imagine. Teachers of our age were going, you can do what? Wow, look at this. And it appeared fantastic. Now, after about a year, when the novelty, the fact that it was new, had worn off, everyone was looking at it thinking, so what now? And we'd spent, our uh, we'd spent our technology budgets. You see, for me, it's not about what equipment we put in our schools. It's not about how many computers we have or how many interactive whiteboards we can buy. Because, of course, what we all know is as soon as you've invested in the latest technology, it's yesterday's technology. And the point is, we're now in Britain, we've got thousands of these things, yet in the two or three years since that investment was made, we've now got high quality Bluetooth technologies. And frankly, every device every child owns has access to the internet and high powered computer tech. So why do we need to buy hardware at all for our schools? Just a thought. You know, one of the things I think is, what we should be doing is saying to young people, bring your technologies into school. And we'll find a way to utilize them and use them properly, properly in education. And if we're going to have projectors, let's have Bluetooth projectors. So the way you interact in the classroom is you beam your Bluetooth technology from your handheld device through your projector. And of course, I'm only talking about the limitations of what's now. So for me, this is not a conversation about what hardware we use or how we use technology. Because frankly, whatever we come up with, we're going to be years behind our children who are already doing things at levels we can't even think about. So what we have to do is ask questions I think slightly differently. And I think the first question we need to ask is this one. What world are we preparing our children for? You see, I have an absolute passion as an educator. Um, and sometimes I know it's very contentious and particularly back home in the UK. Because I believe I'm not an educator in order to help prepare my children to take tests and exams and pass tests and exams. That is not my fundamental purpose. I didn't come into education because I wanted to see how good exam results could be in my classrooms. I'm sure like all of you who work with young people, we all came into education for the same reason, didn't we? And that reason was to make a difference to the lives of the children we work with. 